Welcome to A Place of Hope in Forney, Texas, where you will find hope-filled, obedient, passionate, and engaging people. Now on to today's message with Dr. Kevin Wentworth. Our mission is to be hope-filled, obedient, passionate, engaging followers of Christ. And our vision is to be a place of hope in a hurting world. Very powerful, as far as I'm concerned, mission and vision. And uh, hopefully tonight we have corrected some of our technological problems we've had over the last few weeks. And, and, uh, but we are glad you're here. We've moved the computer up here. And so we made it a little bit closer and made it hot wired into it. So we'll see if all of that works together. But we're glad you're here. Like I said, we, we have a mission. That to, we are calling the followers that, of Christ to be hope-filled, obedient, passionate, and engaging so that people can see it, and then to be a place of hope to a hurting world. And we, uh, I'll tell you what, every, every week there's events going on in our world that's uh, disturbing in a lot of ways, and uh, in more ways than one, and concerned with me but uh, we're going to still be we still have the message of hope and that's the most important thing so tonight we're going to start out with the sermon okay you're going to get it you're going to get the sermon first and so we want you to so here's the title of my sermon where's god when it all goes south you ever heard that phrase it's going south you ever had days like that when you felt like it was going south well Where is God when everything seems to be going south? So let's uh, pray before we get into the message tonight, and we're going to go in Genesis chapter 39, and we'll follow through with it. Father, thank you tonight for the opportunity we have to be here. Uh, We know this weather is very warm, and we're grateful that uh, you are in our hearts warming us and sharing with us and showing us new insights. And I pray that your Holy Spirit tonight would once again speak to us. I pray uh, your blessing upon lives. Thank you for being with uh, Matt and Julia and a new baby that we've been praying for throughout this time and glad that everything's worked out and glad that you were able to take what they faced a few years ago and brought this new child into their lives. I pray tonight you'll be with Pam's mom as she is in the hospital needing your attention and family. And so I pray that you'll be with her and continue to touch her as uh, we continue to wait for news each and every day and every hour. So, But we're grateful for your presence. We pray for our country. Pray for the uh, all the things that have developed this past week and, and all the things that have brought out uh, monumental, really disgust and, and anger and all that. And we know that it does not please the Father who created all of us. And you did create even though no matter what side of the aisle we find ourselves on, you created us all. And we really want to get back to recognize that we need to, to you know, we can, we can say our piece, we can have our opinions, but it isn't right to hurt and to destroy uh, people's property. So I pray that you'll help folks to see it, maybe come to some grips with it. But Father, whatever it is, I pray that you'll protect our country and protect us from the things that... Uh, that are dividing us, but I pray, Father, most importantly, that we would know that there's only one thing, one, one life that can bring us together, and that's the life of Christ who gave his life for us. So thank you for tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to learn from your word, and pray that it will bless as we follow you, for we ask it in thy name. Amen. So where is God when it all goes south? We're coming back to Genesis chapter 39 after deviating to 38, which kind of threw a little curve into but that some preachers would call a rabbit trail. But we're going to turn our attention back to Joseph, and it comes back to 39. And this is an interesting uh, chapter that we're going to read together. And here's what it says. When Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Israelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord, I did a little different, so I want you to remember. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. 
Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph. Here's the interesting testimony. I think sometimes when we've read through the life of Joseph, we don't always see these minute details, but there's some really neat details throughout his story. He, Potiphar noticed something different about Joseph and how important that is for us to think that if we're timid and we don't have an outgoing personality, that people are, people are going to notice something different about us no matter what kind of introvert, extrovert we kind of claim ourselves to be. So Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. Guess what? He noticed Joseph and who was giving him success? The Lord. And he noticed that. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's. Now here's another little thing. If we had time for a bunch of sermons, 39 could give you about three or four sermons. But think about this. The Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. The ripple effect of our relationship. And I think that's really key for us to understand this. I think we, we, we got this thing that you got to be this outgoing personality for God to be. No, I think it can be done within the context of who we are and who we come in contact with. All his household affairs ran smoothly and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing, except what kind of food to eat. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man, and this is important if we go on. And Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded, but Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. Hmm. She kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her, and he kept out of her way as much as possible. One day, however, no one else was around when he went in to do his work. She came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. When she saw that she was holding his cloak and he had fled, she called out to her servant. Soon all the men came running. Look, she said, my husband has brought this Hebrew slave here to make fools of us. He came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream, he ran outside and got away, but he left his cloak behind with me. She kept the cloak with her until her husband came home. Then she told him her story. We're in a novel. Look at this novel that we're writing right now. That Hebrew slave you brought into our house tried to come in and fool around with me, she said. But when I screamed, he ran outside leaving his cloak with me. Joseph put in prison. Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. Anything building up here? All these good things gone on, and then all of a sudden this turned. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison, and he showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prisoner warden. Wow, interesting story. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners. And over everything that happened in the prison, the warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. Have you caught on? Joseph in Potiphar's house, he didn't worry about anything. Now the prisoner guard or the warden is not concerned about anything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. Wow. God is with us even when it doesn't look like it. Think about that. So tonight, as we get into this, like I said, I don't know if you've ever taken time to read. You know, again, 
I'm not saying you don't do it when you read through the Bible, but I don't know if we stop and just take our time and look at it, the emphasis here. So we see that the scriptures from last week turn our attention back to Joseph and reminds us of this event after telling our story about Judah last week. But God spared Joseph's life. And he had a purpose. And the thing that's interesting when we read this is he had a purpose. He is no longer in his own land. He is no longer with his father. He is no longer in his home, Joseph. Joseph has seemingly lost everything. Yet notice what's a key phrase in this chapter. The Lord was with Joseph. Now, you'd begin to think and wonder, really? He's with him. We see that truth put out quite a bit here. He found favor with Potiphar, and he was put in charge of the whole house, and he found favor with the warden. And we know that it went on and told us about his looks and everything else. But Potiphar's wife was relentless. She was relentless. Every day she tried to seize him. She lies about the event. She saying that he's fled and all, we see the story written out before us. Now, I want us to see something that we may be shocking. Listen to what the words of verse 21 says. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love, gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. I want you to catch that because this is important. My first point is this. God is with us even when it doesn't look like it. I think that's an important aspect because you would almost tend to believe, if you look at the life of Joseph, does it look like God is with him? Here he's trying to stay true. Joseph had been sold into slavery, yet the Lord was with him. From a human point of view, we would think that Joseph is out of favor with God because of all these terrible circumstances. And I think that's important for us today in our society. You know, what would we expect that if God is with Joseph, wouldn't he be rewarded? But we're not seeing that tendency throughout this whole thing. Again, we have the privilege of seeing the whole picture where we don't see it here in this particular setting. That's why I think it's important to take this in bits and pieces so that we, first of all, can get into the story, get into what it's trying to say to us, and recognize that God is with us even when it doesn't look like it. Is he benefited by his integrity? Did he, or is there a ben, did, you know, his integrity, what, why didn't he go after Potiphar's wife? It was about his integrity. But yet, we see what happened. He suffered and suffered imprisonment. This was not, Joseph wasn't a mature 50-year-old individual when these temptations came. He was a young man, faithfully discharging the duties as a slave and remained faithful to the Lord every day. So we, when we look at this whole 39th chapter, does it look like he's in favor with God? Some would say, now again, we know the story, but we have to be honest. If we were to look at our individual, and yet, isn't it interesting, if we look at this story, how many times have you had situations in your life wondering, how could God be doing this to me? Look at all that I'm doing for him. I think we've all been there, haven't we? We've all had that issue in our lives. You know, the older we get, sometimes we kind of believe, begin to start to believe, but I even think there's new things that come upon us. But it's interesting how we tend to fall back into this when if I'm doing all this for God and I'm faithful to God and I've got in my integrity to God and all this, it seems like I ought to be rewarded. And I think there's an interesting side that we'll see that tonight. Joseph's now in prison. It doesn't look like God is with Joseph. From our perspective, we might think not. And from our own life, in the moment that we're in, we may not think so. But the scriptures make it very clear. That's why it's important for us. The God was still with Joseph. We see it all the time. But here's an interesting thing that goes along with this. And I think I said it. Uh, either last week or the week before. Favor with God does not mean good circumstances all the time on this earth. 
Now, that doesn't seem fair to me. I've been a good guy all my life. I never smoked. I never drank. I never chewed. And I didn't go with any girls that did. And you think that, and I'm a preacher. I deserve to be treated better, as some would say, than not. But you know, it's all about the perspective. We'll get into that. We learn a very important truth. Favor with God does not mean good circumstances. God, and I want, you to, I want to imprint this on your mind, God is present with his people even in the worst of our circumstances. Even in the worst of our circumstance. Now, some of you don't, I didn't need to tell you that. But I think sometimes we need to be reminded that when we think, now how many of you have had, ever had this statement made? I don't know how much more I can take. How come? All this is piled on all at one time. Have we ever been there? No, we've never been there, have we? What I'm trying to say to you, how many times, even in our own minds, have we thought, how much more is God going to allow me to take? And then we always use that phrase, he won't put on you more than you can bear. The problem is that's a different type of scripture that we need to be careful of. That's true, but we, it's taken a little bit out of context. But God is present with his people, even the worst of circumstances. There are many times in life when faithfulness does not look like it's working. There are times in life when faithfulness, doing what we feel God wants us to do, doesn't seem like it's working. But what is the point of being faithful when we continue to experience loss and suffering? How many of you ever met, some of you grew up on this song, but there's an interesting song that goes like this. Tempted and tried, we're oft made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. While there are others living about us, never molested, though in the wrong. Anybody know what that song is? It's an old hymn. Tempted and tried, we're oft made to wonder. Why it should be thus all the day long while there are others living about us, never molested, though in the wrong. Everybody catching the name of it? Another verse goes like this. When death has come and taken our loved ones, it leaves our home so lonely and drear. Then do we wonder why others prosper, living so wicked year after year. Anybody catch on? Farther along we'll know all about it. Farther along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. Now, did that bring back a little bit of memory from Quartet Pass? Farther along, we'll understand why. And that's the truth about our journey with God, in my opinion. Consider how ridiculous the promise of God may have sounded to him, Joseph. Joseph had a dream that his brothers would bow down to him. Not only is Joseph ripped away from his family, now he's in prison. How is God's promise going to come true? How am I going to ever see what's going on? Nothing looked, and I want you to catch it with me, please. It's hard to bring you in because this, is, this has been really stirring within my heart. Nothing looked like God was with him. If you look at the surface, nothing looked like God was with him. 
And yet he was trying to be and was being faithful. Nothing suggested that God's promises were still valid. But Joseph still believed in the promises of God. If Joseph were to ask, where is God? The answer would be that God was with Joseph from the very beginning. He was with Joseph from the very beginning, even though it doesn't look like it. And have you ever had a time in your own life when you felt the Lord had left you? I think there are times, I, th I think we've, I think if we'd be honest with us, yourself, there would be times when that question has popped into our minds. No, I, I don't think it's wrong to ever think that way. There are times in our humanness that we think, has God left us? Because you think because your life is difficult that it means that God is no longer with you. Has your suffering caused you to question the good goodness and the steadfastness of the love of God? Has the weight of your trials caused you to question the presence of the Lord? Can I say this with profound enthusiasm? I want to say this to you. The Lord is still with you. He hasn't left you. And yet so often the human side of us but begins to wonder. But notice this. You do not know that God is with you by some sort of feeling. Joseph does not have that. I would suggest to you that he did not feel like God was with him. But what's happening here is God is positioning Joseph in a way we'll see, and we kind of know if we've read his story, but he's positioning Joseph in a way yet to be seen. And can I say it once again to us? No matter what our age, no matter how long we've been in the church, God is still in the business of positioning us where he needs us to be. When I think about our, our church and I'm, I want to use Bill and Linda a little bit. They won't, they won't like this, and I didn't get their permission. But when I think about Bill and Linda, and I think about their setting and the church at Journey, I, I think that sometimes our district family needs to understand that we need to realize we are now moved back into Dallas instead of moving out of Dallas. With that church, we now are in Dallas, which the church Nazarene has left Dallas. And I'm excited about what's going on there, but with Bill and Linda and, and others, I, I'm going to say there's others that have fallen into, the, into the, the love. But what I'm trying to say, all the things that they've gone through, I believe, without a shadow of a doubt, not just because of Jonathan, but because God's positioning them to be in the place that they need to be, even though it may not look like it, and even though all the circumstances didn't line up as we would want them, I can tell you this. It's changed our lives, and I think it's changed their lives to see how it's worked. And I think it's important. I don't want to just sh show out to them, but what I'm trying to say to you is even, and I won't, the, the, even the youngster, Bill and Linda, those youngsters, you know, even they're finding a role in what God's doing, and he's placing them in a position to be an effect upon what God's called them to be. And I think that's what we have to always understand. I believe I could tell you that story after story after story on this district as a district superintendent. Remaining in Potiphar's house is not the plan for Joseph. Things are going to change as we see the hand of God working in the world. But there's a second thing we must always remember. Are you ready? Satan doesn't let up even when it looks like he wins. <laughs> Amen. Now, I do believe that Satan kind of lets you off the hook for a while. I do. I've seen it. Satan's kind of worked out, and he knows, he, well, I'm not going to win that battle, and he kind of pulls back. I got news for you. He ain't done. Satan's never done. If he can get you to, to, to think Satan will continue to attack. It, even though it looks like he's won, he'll do that. Satan doesn't leave us alone. 
And we can see that. Satan will continue to compound our difficulties. And then, as I know in church life that I've been involved in, at times we can be overwhelmed by the trials of life. What has Joseph done to cause him to be in Egyptian prison? What has he done? From the surface, he's done absolutely nothing wrong. All he's tried to do through this whole time is be faithful. And the reward of his faithfulness takes him from bad to worse. So I want us to always, I guess what I'm saying in these sermons, when we look at the life of Joseph, I want us to always realize, and again, those of us who have been raised in church, this might not be too shocking of a statement, but I think we have to always understand Satan doesn't attack in typical manners. He uses a lot of different tactics. He'll use a lot of different ways. He'll use even sliding on ice in a wind, an ice storm and cause our arm to be busted. Satan will do some, that wasn't subtle though. <laughs> that was pretty dramatic. But I'm trying to say to us, is Satan does not give up. He doesn't like losing, and he always, even if he thinks he's winning, he still doesn't let up. He'll always be there, to see, and we see that in this. You'd think by now Joseph had an excuse to reject God, and he should no longer have to live faithfully. He could have thought he would get away with the sin by going, why don't he just go ahead and, and sleep with Potiphar's wife? He could have thought that God had left him. He could have thought that it didn't matter what he did in Egypt. No one sees, no one cares, could have been his attitude. But praise God. What's powerful about this, Joseph remains faithful to his God. He remains faithful despite the life circumstances, no matter what it looked like. He could have. Oh, I don't, I can, why don't I just do this? Nobody will ever notice. No one will ever see. I'm in a different country. No one, it won't probably get back to my family. But Satan, I've found over the years, wants to push us over the edge so that we will give in to that kind of an attitude. Satan is pushing us over and over to reject the promises of God. And as a pastor, I've seen this happen over and over again. And I've watched people and everyone that's sitting in here and all those that you will listen throughout the week, you've known some people They got beat up and he won. And they walked away from the church. We know that happened. And there have been times when maybe any of us might want to do that. Just curse God, Job's wife said to Job. Satan pushes us to act out against the people of God. Satan pushes us to turn our backs on God. Why should we trust in the Lord? Why should we maintain our faithfulness? And here's the last one. Because the last point is this. You are not alone. That's how we can know. When you think about Jesus, all the things he experienced in life, I think I've told you this before, but one of the things that keeps me going in the different positions and the different tra- trails that I've been on in the pastorate. The thing that keeps me going and the things that even in the times of discouragement, even in the times of letter writing, my resignation, even in the times when I wonder, is this all worth it? There's been an interesting thing that's kept me going. You know what it is? Remembering all that Jesus went through for me. That's always been my hang on to thing. You follow that? I want you to hear that. I go back to see what Jesus ridiculed, spit upon, called all kinds of names, and yet what did he do? He kept doing faithfulness of God's word. And if he can do it, he's told me, that through his spirit, I can do it. And even though I have this phrase that I use quite a bit to pastors and even to myself, I'm going to let you have a human reaction, 
but I can't let you live there. And the reason is, our human reactions, we may be entitled to from time to time, but if we keep living there, we'll fall away from God. But if we recognize that after we come to our senses and realize what Jesus went through, it ought to give us to me, should, and that's my opinion, of course, we ought to have the strength to go on. We don't have to look to Joseph to know that others have suffered as we have. We can look to Jesus and understand that he is a faithful high priest for us. God was with Jesus, yet Jesus endured what he did for us. And I realize it's very important that we understand what did the faithfulness of Jesus accomplish, folks? What did the faithfulness of Jesus accomplish? For those of us in this room, look around. I'm one of his accomplishments. You're one of his accomplishments. That's what Jesus' faithfulness that looked awful did for us. If there's anything in your life that's brought you to these points in your heart, I just want you to make sure you look to Jesus. Look to him. He accomplished the will and the plan of the Father. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 and 16, in another version, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every aspect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. God is with us even when it doesn't look. Can I just kind of implant that in you? When you think he's not, always remember he is. Now you may walk away from him, but he's promised he wouldn't walk away from you. Always remember too, Satan doesn't give up. If he can't get you here, right? We've heard this before. If he can't get you at this point, he'll try something else. And he'll use something very precious to you at times. But also remember this. You are not alone. That is the truth for us tonight. So we're going to close out and worship tonight. So um, I want to just have you join me. You'll know most of these songs, some, a couple of new ones for you. But uh, we're going to share praise and worship toward the end. And we'll leave out in a higher note of praise and thanksgiving. And uh, first song we're going to sing is I Stand Amazed in the Presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Why don't you stand? You've been sitting for a while. I preached for about 30 minutes. So I'm going to let you sit down and stand up and kind of stretch out, okay? I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love. sorrows he made them his very own he bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how Savior's love for me. And with a ransom 
something glory His face I at last shall see He will my joy through the ages To sing of His love for me In the house of Zion, we will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things, we will say together. We will feast and weep no more. Let's sing that verse again just to kind of get you a chance to learn this. We will feast. We will feast in the house. dark of night before the dawn my soul be not afraid for the promised morn me know how long oh God of Jacob be my strength vow we've broken and betrayed. You are the faithful one, and from the garden to the grave, bind us to
will say together, we will feast and we no more. We will feast and we. the truth for us tonight to know when I think about what we have gone through in the 39th chapter of Genesis one of my favorite songs is he knows my name so there's no doubt when I read through the 39th chapter he knows Joseph's name he knows all about Joseph and guess what put your name in there he knows about you I have a maker he formed my heart before even time began my life was in his hand brought you from and realize he knows all about you he knows all that's gone on in your life but I just want you to kind of sing it with me and just kind of personalize it he knows my name he knows my every thought falls and hears me when I call and hears me when I call and hears me when I call That song always gets to me just because it just personalizes for me to be reminded he knows me <laughs> he knows me well and he just knows me he sees 
He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls, and he does as we see. Hear me when I call. So we're going to close out praise to God and what he's done for us and talk about how great he is. Why don't you stand with me for this last song? And we'll sing how great is our God, the splendor of the King, clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. Sing it now. How great is our God. Sing with me. Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our. Sing that one more time. How great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. He's a name above all names. it up. He's name above all names. He's a name above all names. He is worthy of our praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. And then to the Fumer hymn.
And all will see how great, how great is our God. Before we walk out the doors, let's sing that one more time. How great is our God, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. people said amen marty would you while they're standing up take the offering for me will you please Thank you for listening today. Join us every Monday night at 6.30 p.m. at 413 South Bodark Street in Forney, Texas. If you'd like to learn more, email us at kwentworth at netxnaz.net. That's k-w-e-n-t-w-o-r-t-h at n-e-t-x-n-a-z dot net.